Okay, so today I am basically going to tell you about some research that I started this year. I'm going to give you an overview of the project. It's really great that I can do that in a room filled with so many people that I hope will be the stakeholders and the benefiters, benefit, benefiters and benefactors, if you like, um, of my research. So please, whilst I'm giving the presentation, think through the kinds of things I say I'm going to do. If there are problems you have in your organisation um, or information that you need that you currently don't have that you think I might be able to get for you, then please let me know and I'll do my best to include that in my research project. So, <laughs> this is a who am I and where do I come from slide. I'm a cultural anthropologist. I don't study ants. I'm not bones. I prefer to talk to living people rather than dead ones. Um, my research interests are predominantly qualitative. I do interviews, ethnography, hang out with people, I try and see the world from people's point of view rather than imposing a sense of what's right or wrong on them. I want to know what people think is right or wrong and why or why not. So I like to get, get at people's perceptions, attitudes, beliefs and rationales for the kind of behaviour that they engage in. As a cultural anthropologist, I specialise in human-animal relations. So I'm very interested in the role that animals play in people's lives, the different significance that animals might have to people and how that can define one cultural group from another. And more theoretically, I'm really interested in risk and risk perception. And, and a lot of that comes from the research centre that I work with. I'm currently with the Appleton Institute, the research group formerly, formerly known as UniSA's Centre for Sleep Research. We do a lot of research with planes, trains and automobiles, looking at risk and fatigue management, developing rostering systems and things like that. And my research group has done a lot of research with the bushfire CRC in the past. So it's all about animals and risk for me from a people-centred perspective, and that's where I'm coming at my research from. Uh, just to give you an overview of the kinds of research I've already done in this space, I am the world anthropology expert on mounted bullfighting. <laughs> that's my PhD topic, um, very much around voluntary risk and the extent, to pitch, the extent to which some people will knowingly expose animals to risks, but rationalise that or justify that in their own minds, or even feel uh, quite honestly, that they do not feel that they're putting animals at risk. Um, this picture I've put up, this is uh, Noelia Mota. She was on the top of the bullfighting ladder a couple of years ago, which is quite, quite rare for a woman. Uh, this is an accident where a bull knocked her horse over and then her horse rolled on top of her. So there's real risks for horse and rider. That are, so there's quite an, a human-animal implication here. Another project I've done is with Aventus in Australia. We did some interviews with Aventus, um, the equestrian sport that's associated with the highest risk, um, perhaps aside from rodeo. Um, it's a good thing Hatchie's not here, he would get me for saying um. <laughs> we talked to riders about how they perceived risk in this sport and, and how they weighed up pros and cons, what kind of risk minimisation they were, they were willing to take and what were the barriers to them taking on more risk minimisation. I repeated that, that project, which was mostly interview based, with show jumpers on the European Ambassadors Circuit in May 2011. So we spoke to riders from across different countries. I tried to find a picture of show jumping and risk on Google, and a keyword search with that came up with no images of falls. Um, so I've picked this picture because there appears to be somebody who's fainted out of boredom in the background. <laughs> they were probably watching the dressage. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, another project on risk and animals is where I evaluated the Delta Dog Safe program in South Australia, which is designed to minimise dog bites to children. And a colleague and I have looked at human animal co-sleeping practices to look at the impact of people that sleep, on their, sleep with their pets on the quality of their sleep, which incidentally was, was quite low. It took people longer to get to sleep, they were sleepier upon waking, they were more prone to sleep disturbances, but they experienced the same wakefulness during the day. Uh, as you know, I've already also done a study on um, dangers to vets um, during their training. I couldn't find an image of vet and injury, but I know this one's been injured a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, um, the, uh, I did some work with, very lucky to be invited to do work with Chris and Belinda on the survey around floating and driving practices. And this leads me to my, my current research, which is around animals and natural disasters. And it really came about after the Victorian bushfires in 2009, where I, I read a lot of stories about people 
who had sacrificed their lives trying to save animals. So I've done some, I started doing some research by looking at images of Sam the koala, who you would all recognise. Don't worry about it. I think it's mine. I know it is. <laughs> okay. So let's think, uh, we all implicitly in this room know that animals matter in disasters, but what does the research tell us? Study from 97, where 81% of horse owners stated that the concern for their horses would impact their decisions. That's stated behaviour, it's not revealed behaviour, we don't know what they would actually do, could, do more, could have more impact or less. In relation to chemical spills, we know that owners are less likely to evacuate. If they do evacuate, they're going to be likely to return to try and save their animals, whether they're allowed back in or not. And that's just going to have a flow-on effect of problems, putting uh, responders at risk, their friends and family at risk as well. From the California floods, it was found that pet ownership was the most significant factor in failure to evacuate households. Animal owners were less likely to evacuate. Um, and this risk increased for every additional cat or dog in the house. In relation to hurricanes, m the majority of pet owners tried to save their animals. That's not my research, actually. Um, Hurricane Irene, pet, this is the only study I've come across that says pet ownership was not statistically significant for household evacuation failure. But people were still saying they were having difficulty evacuating because of trouble moving their pets. And often that was for really basic reasons, like not having enough dog or cat carriers. So why should we, looking at this international research, what does this mean for Australia? Australia, together with the UK and the USA, has one of the highest um, incidences of pet ownership. 91% of those people report feeling very close to pets. 80% have said that they would risk their lives to save pets. And when we look at um, analyses of flood-related fatalities over approximately a 200-year period, more than 8% of deaths were reported from people trying to rescue pets, stock or property, even if the animal was not their own. So we can look at that 63% of pet ownership and imagine how many people who don't own pets, that are friends with, neighbours with, family with, people that own pets, you can really see the impact of pet ownership on people's survival in natural disasters. So what might one conclude from all of this research? Well, it's pretty easy to say, geez, animals are a bit of a risk factor. You're not going to get out quickly. <laughs> You're more likely to go back in. Oh, well, if that was the case, that'd be pretty easy fixed. Uh, option one, remove the risk. We know we can't ban pet ownership. It's a ridiculous suggestion. It's not going to happen. So we can continue to keep doing research to try and calculate the risk, or we can actually do something about it. And we've got to start thinking, what actually is the risk we're talking about? Is there a risk of animal ownership or animal attachment? Or, as I'm proposing with, the, with this research, is the risk actually that of not helping people protect and not helping people evacuate with their animals? So that leads um, me to my task which is to try and re reconfigure this risk. Let's change what we think about animals as risk factors. Can we turn animal attachment, animal ownership into a protective factor? Can we make people who have animals and pets more resistant, better prepared, more likely to evacuate sooner? So can we think of animals as protective factors? This is the title of, of my current project. It's funded by the Australian Research Council for three years. Um, for about $370,000, which has been matched by my university in, in in-kind and top-ups. That's really encouraging. The Australian Research Council has given so much money to an animal-centred project. It's really quite rare. There's no research code for human-animal relations or animal studies. So this is really promising. I think we should be really heartened by that. Hmm. So you wouldn't be surprised, after what I've said, to learn that my objective is to save human lives, incidentally animal lives, by identifying how we can use animals to motivate people to be better prepared, to evacuate sooner, and to survive natural disasters. And if you think back to the slide that had diff the different research that's been undertaken on hurricanes, chemical spills, you can see there's not a, there's not a broad scope of different dimensions, we might say, of, of risk. So I really want to try and get a, a more thorough understanding of risk at three particular dimensions. The first one's around types of disasters. Um, and because the project's already ambitious, we've narrowed that down to two disasters. 
So we'll be looking at fire and flood in Australia. Types of animals. Most of the research is around dogs and cats, and, and more than that, dogs and cats in a household. There's very little research around um, the impact of livestock or wildlife, or that odd category in between of horses. I've already got a sense. For <laughs> and horse owners, who are also an odd, uh, odd category in between. So three types of animals, two types of disasters, and then in terms of location, this is probably something we're less interested in, but we do want to cover people living in urban, rural, and peri-urban areas where they might have different escape routes, different behaviours, and especially different social networks to call on. Uh, disaster research is, is commonly, commonly splits disasters into four stages, PPRR. The project I've been talking about so far is focused on prevention and preparedness, so the very early stages, with the thought that if we can get people out of danger, there's going to be less demand uh, on services post-disaster in response centres, for example. So the current project is looking at animal owners or caretakers at, at a very community level. I have um, been lucky to be involved with another project that will kick off next year, funded by the new Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC, previously the Bushfire CRC, where we've really designed that project to, to bookend the first project in a way. That one's going to be looking at the responder community interface. What are, the, what are the trouble, what kind of troubles do responders have interacting with community members, encouraging them to leave their homes? Um, but so, so the focus is on responders and in terms of the stage of disaster, that project's more focused on the, on the end stages, looking at relief and recovery and there'll be a particular emphasis on grief that people might experience at the loss of pets or, gr or relative grief that people might experience when they've lost pets and neighbours have lost human family members. So looking at how that might play out in a, in a post-trauma situation in terms of community rebuilding. Um, and then a, a project on the side that that's, will be finished this year is something I'm doing with WISPA, looking at how we improve the resilience of vulnerable groups, such as the disabled, people with mental health issues, Indigenous Australians, um, and children. So this is what's going on. Now if we go, go back to thinking about that first project, which started this year, it's got three phases, one phase for each year. Currently in year one, so we've been going through interviews undertaken by the bushfire CRC when they go out with what they call task forces. After there's been a fire incident, they get a group of researchers together and we go out and interview community, community members. And we basically get community members to take us through the day or the days that the fire occurred from when they first found out about it to when they felt danger had passed and talking to them about uh, where they got their information from, what kinds of steps they took. Thank you. And Pets, pets do come up in those interviews in terms of we, we talk to people and say, what's the, did you have a plan? Yes. Um, what was your plan? And it's a suitcase and a dog, or a suitcase and a dog and children. <laughs> if the children are older, sometimes they're prioritised third. But pets are really coming up in terms of those interviews. So I'm going through those just looking at what's falling out with pets. Based on what we find there, we'll be developing a, a pet-centred or an animal-centred um, qualitative interview guide to, to try and pull apart in much more detail and, and clarify what we're finding in stage one. So that's what's happening next year. And we'll be interviewing people that have survived natural disasters, getting that spread of uh, type of animal and type of geographic region. The areas we'd planned to do research in, they, they hadn't been locked down, but we were considering Donnelly in Tasmania until the recent New South Wales fire, so that's probably back on, on the table. And to look at flood, uh, probably the Lockyer Valley. And myself and my uh, PhD student Josh will probably set up camp for two to four weeks in one of those sites, get to know the community, talk to people, do our qualitative interviews, probably around 40 of them all up. And then interviewing key informants. In the final year, we'll be taking everything we've learnt from stage one and two and developing a national online survey, which we can split into people that, people that have animals and haven't lived through a disaster, people that have animals and have lived through a disaster. Those who have will find out what contributed to their behaviour, those who haven't will find out if they have a plan, what it is, and if they don't have a plan, why not? So what do we hope to do with all of this? Well, after we've identified the barriers and enablers to survival in relation to animals, we hope to be able to increase the enablers, decrease the barriers. 
we hope to be able to feed into some kind of emergency preparedness public health campaign, however that might look in relation to um, iPhone apps, brochures, messaging, um, whether we should be talking on radio or television, whether we should be targeting different groups of animal owners, and how do we talk to people who might have different kinds of animals or different roles for the same animal, so people that have house dogs and work dogs, for example. And I've, I've already, they were the, the, the aims and, and goals as set down by the project, but I've already noticed some other spin-off peripheral ideas coming out of the project. One of them is the potential for using the area of risk and disasters to encourage people to train their dogs. If you want to feel safe to, to evacuate from your home and know that somebody's going to come behind you and collect your dogs, it's in your interest to have a well-trained dog that emergency services can pick up. And the other idea that's really fallen out of this conference is will people's risk-taking behaviours reduce as their expectations, their reinforced expectations of a qualified team coming to help them becomes normalised? When people start to expect that there's going to be rescue teams around, will they be more likely to actually back away knowing that the animals will be looked after? So thank you very much. Um, further information on these sites, please join the LinkedIn page or the Facebook page so we can keep communicating. Thank you.